questions from the commission. Okay, then the item is certified. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we can ask Commissioner De La Luz to come back and uh, we'll move on to item number five, 1675 Westchester Avenue rezoning for the development of a mixed-use building with commercial and community facility space and about 220 affordable residential units. Uh, Justin Lamorella of the Bronx office will present the application. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Lago, Commissioners. This is an application for a zoning map change from R6 to R8A and from R6 to R8A with a C24 overlay and a zoning text amendment to Appendix F for mandatory inclusionary housing to facilitate the development of a mixed-use building with approximately 220 units of affordable housing. The applicant is a joint venture between Fifth Houses and the Acacia Network called 1675 Westchester JV Associates, LLC. The proposal concerns 1675 Westchester Avenue, including two lots within the Bronx section of the Bronx Community District 9. The property is located along the Elevated 6 train, down here, uh, two blocks east of the Morrison Avenue Soundview Station. Um, Westchester Avenue is a major east-west corridor in the Bronx, and just to the west of the proposed site um, is the Bronx River Parkway, a major north-south limited access highway. Beyond the 6 train, the area is well served by transit, including the BX4, 4A, 36, and 27 buses. The property is located at the end of a residential block bound by Westchester Avenue to the south, uh, Metcalf Avenue to the west, and Fatelli Avenue to the east. The property is part of an R6 zoning district today that has been in place since 1961. R6 districts allow for residential uses with an FAR up to 2.43 and 3.0 under quality housing rules and community facility uses with an FAR up to 4.8. The blocks to the north and east of the proposed site are mostly residential, with a mix of attached and semi-attached one and two family residences, as well as larger apartment buildings. Across Westchester Avenue is a commercial shopping center, including a fine fair supermarket, a drugstore and post office that has a C12 overlay today. The development site, owned by the applicant, um, is an approximately 29,000 square foot lot with a vacant one-story former health clinic building and a paved parking area that closed in 2012. The adjacent 4,900 square foot lot at the corner of Westchester and Fatelli Avenues today has a one-story commercial building with two stores operating in it, a wine and liquor store and a dry cleaner. Commercial uses are not permitted in R6 districts and therefore these existing retail uses within the project area are considered legal non-conforming uses. Um, so these photos show you the site as it is today. Photos one and two show you the corner of Westchester Avenue and Metcalf Avenues. Um, photo one here is taken from the vantage point of the elevated six train. And photo two is taken from the fine fair parking lot looking at the, um, at the site. The development site would be over here on the left and the existing businesses are here on the right. The proposed action would rezone block 3780, lot 51 and a portion of lot one. An R8A zoning district would be applied within 200 feet perpendicularly of Westchester Avenue, while a C24 commercial overlay district would be applied within 100 feet perpendicularly of Westchester. This action would bring the aforementioned legal non-conforming active businesses on the site into conformance. While the proposed rezoning affects lots one and 51, the development site is located only on lot one at the corner of Metcalf in Westchester, uh, shown here outlined in red on the tax and a small portion of the development site would remain R6. These actions would facilitate the development of approximately 220 units of affordable housing for low to moderate income households. As a related action, the applicant is seeking a text amendment to Appendix F to, de to designate the project area as MIH with option two. So this would guarantee that 30% of the units be designated up to 80% AMI. For this project, that means about 66 units would be permanently affordable. While the affordability levels of the proposed project have not been finalized at this point, currently the applicant expects to offer units at a range of affordability from 30% AMI up to 80% AMI. A small portion may be made available to households earning up to 100% AMI. The median income in the area is approximately $29,382. 
The applicant is also seeking funding from New York City Department of Housing Preservation and Development and New York City Housing Development Corporation. The proposed development would construct a 13-story mixed-use building with approximately 203,000 square feet of floor area for a total FAR of 7.06. The ground floor would include approximately 7,500 feet of commercial retail space along, with, along Westchester Avenue and up to 6,800 square feet of community facility space along Metcalf Avenue. The remainder of the building would include approximately 188,000 square feet of residential floor area with up to 20, 220 residential units. There would be a mix of studio, one bedroom, two bedroom, and three bedroom units. The entrance to the residential portion of the building would be along Metcalf Avenue, shown here in yellow. Amenities for residents are expected to include a roof terrace, a community room opening onto the terrace, a laundry room, fitness room, children's playroom, and computer study room. A landscaped rear yard would provide recreational space for use by building residents. There would not be any parking spaces provided with this project. The applicant anticipates that any units affordable to tenants earning more than 80% AMI would be few enough that the parking requirement would be below the maximum of 15 spaces, which could be waived. The proposed building would rise to a total height of 132 feet with 13 stories, a ground floor containing commercial and community facility uses and 12 stories of residential above. The street wall height would be 10 stories for most of the frontage along Metcalf and Westchester Avenues, and a dormer at the corner of Metcalf and Westchester would rise to 12 stories with the remainder of the building behind it. Along Metcalf, there are 10-foot set setbacks at the 11th and 13th floors, while along Westchester Avenue, there is an 11 to 14-foot setback at the 11th floor only. The side yard along Metcalf Avenue would measure 34 feet, and the minimum rear yard would measure approximately 43 feet. Um, th this shows some of the renderings of the proposed building. The project will be designed to meet passive house standards, meaning it will maximize energy efficiency through building design and will seek Passive Health Certification with Passive Health Institute US. The project will participate in Enterprise Green Communities Initiative and the state's new construction program. The roofs above the 13th floor will support solar panels. And the building will have a combined heat and power cogeneration system. So in conclusion, the actions to rezone the area and apply MIH will permit the development of approximately 220 units of affordable housing, 30% of which would be per permanently affordable in a mixed-use building. Thank you. Thank you, Justin. Questions from the commissioner? Commissioner Levin. Well, it's, a, it's, it's becoming a perpetual question. What's the, um, this is a very large building in an area surrounded by uh, one and two family homes and pretty solidly zoned R6 and maybe some R5 in the surrounding area. What's the land use rationale for this double jump from R6 to R8A? The, the rationale is that it's located on um, two wide streets of Westchester and uh, Metcalf. And then across from the site on uh, Metcalf is the Bronx River Parkway. So it's uh, another uh, wide street as well. Um, it's located on the on Long Transit, two blocks <coughs> from uh, a station. Um, and so uh, I think it's, it's felt that uh, you know, a lot of people would have access to transit and would be an appropriate place to put uh, density and height. Uh, facing a uh, you know, wide intersection um, located near transit. Other questions? Commissioner Delulu. Could you talk a little bit about what level of engagement there's been so far with the community about the proposed project and the rezoning? Um, I don't know the, the details of that, but uh, we can look into that and get back to you. Okay. Yes, Commissioner Efron. Thank you, and, and thank you for answering um, Commissioner Levin's question. Um, and I just have a sort of a follow-up to that. How, how should we get comfortable with the idea that if there is um, a zoning up to 8 a, or 8 a here, that we are not then setting the context for 8A just behind it and so on and so on and so on? Yeah, I think that's a good question. I think because it is fronting on Westchester, which is the wide street, mm -hmm. um, you know, it, it may not make sense further on the residential blocks behind it. Mm -hmm. um, but next to, and so, just curious about yeah. setting a precedent for new context without there really being uh, an understanding that 
this has its own implication. <coughs> Perhaps it's a rhetorical question. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. Um, I'm just a bit concerned, and more, mine is more of a statement and not a question. You know, we seem to, in the Bronx, have to, happen to have a lot of these lots, larger lots, near subways, near larger streets, in back of residential communities that are one and two stories, uh, one and two family homes, up to three <laughs> and four stories. And the concern has been voiced very clearly, you know, by a couple of members of the commission regarding the doubling and tripling and even quadrupling in this instance of, of height in these types of neighborhoods. Um, it, it, it also presents a challenge of, of something that appears to be spot zoning. Um, so I, I, there, is a, it, it, there is a concern about the, 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 the rezonings that we've done recently and the doubling, quadrupling, of, doubling, tripling, quadrupling of heights in communities where you're going to shadow out some of the residential that's already existing. Understanding you know, some of the rationale behind it. And so there's a concern that I think we should investigate. That is, thank you. Other questions, comments from the commission? Well, again, thank you. Lots of input um, that I'm sure will get teased out during the uh, public review process. And this application is then certified. Item number six on page 129 of your package, the Escuela Hispana Montessori II Child Care Center is an acquisition for a loose, the lease renewal to facilitate the continued use of a child care center. Uh, Xin Yu Liang uh, will do the presentation. Um, Xin Yu. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, Chair Lago. Good afternoon, Commissioners. This is um, public applications, the administ administrative for Children's Service and the Department of Citywide Administrative Service DCAS are seeking approval of the acquisition of an existing building to facilitate the continued operation of a child care center located at 180 Suffolk Street in the Lower East Side Manhattan Community District 3. The proposed action will allow for a 10-year lease renewal to be negotiated. The building is privately owned and has been leased by the city for use as a child care center since 1973. A previous acquisition application was approved by the City Planning Commission on October 21st, 1992 for a period up to 20 years and all without the time limitation if the site is acquired with lease. The facility is on a through lot and has frontage on both Suffolk Streets and Clinton Street between East Houston Street and Stanton Street. The site is zoned in R8A and R7A zoning district with a C15 commercial overlay along Clinton Street frontage. The built form of the surrounding area is predominantly characterized by four to seven story multifamily mixed use residential buildings, as well as public facilities and institutions. This is a photo taken on Suffolk Street, and this is the facilities. And this is a photo taken on Clinton Street, and this is the uh, child care center. Yeah. The, congreg the congregation Chanson Sofa, the Annabella Silver School, the Moffat Valley High School, and the PS 140 Northern Strauss Elementary School are all within 600 feet radius. There are two uh, open spaces nearby. One is the Northern Strauss Playground, and the other one is the ABC Playground. The site is conveniently accessible by public transportation, the J, M, Z, and F train station are uh, closely within three blocks away, like around this here. And the M9, M14, and M21 buses are all within three blocks away. The ACS child care facility is located in a three-story, privately owned and occupies the entire building, including a cellar, two rooftop play areas, and the ground level play areas in the rear. It includes a total of 31,498 square feet, comprising about 22,000 square feet of interior spaces and approximately 9,000 square feet of rooftop and outdoor play areas. The outdoor ground play area is accessible from the first floor, and there is here's a photos. And a small roof play area is located above portions of the 
first floor, and the roof above the third floor includes the main play areas, which is shown in these pictures. The main entrance is located along Suffer Street and leads to the first floor. The secondary egress door is located on Suffer Street as well as third egress door on Clinton Street. In total, there are 12 classrooms in this three-story building, four classrooms on each floor. The cellar level contains a mechanical rooms. The kitchen is located on the first floor. There are 54 professional, paraprofessional, and support staff. The child care center has a capacity to serve up to 174 children ages, ages two to five years old under a license from the New York City Department of Health. The children may attend from 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. Monday through Friday. And the children are taken to and from the, cent uh, taken to and from the center by their parents. The center provides meal services, including breakfast, lunch, and snack daily, as well as supervised playtime and appropriate education. The Department of City Planning staff toured the facility on May 4, 2017, with staff from the daycare center program, ACS, and City Hall, and confirmed that the facility was in a, good, in a state of good repair, with general improvement to be made, pursuant to the proposed scope of work. The to facilitate this program, the project requests a public facility acquisition for the daycare center. The proposed ac action will facilitate a lease renewal to be continued use of the property as a daycare center for 10 years. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions from the commission? Yes, Commissioner Cerullo. Thank you. I just have a quick question. I mean, it's, it's quite a significant staff um, in the building, do we know? I know the capacity is 174. What is the average enrollment? Um, yes, so we have the data um, back to June 2016, and there were 135 children enrolled at that time. Okay. But we can confirm and get back to you for the current enrollment. Sure, thank you. Thank you. Other questions? Commissioner Levin. Um, thank you for providing the scope of work at this point in the process. It's helpful for us to um, be able to take a look at that because um, I think if, as we've come to understand through the series of applications like this that we've seen, the one sort of major value of having these go through a public process is that we can be sure these are in the best yes. possible condition. So it's nice to know exactly what needs to be done. Is this work to be done by the landlord or by the city? Once we enter into a lease agreement, these a scope of work are responsible by the landlord. So th this is the stuff that's been worked out that the landlord will do? Yes, Great. but DDC is engineer from the DDC go to the site visit and confirm and come with this scope of work. Excellent, that's good to know. Thank you. Questions. Okay, then thank you. This matter is certified. Item number seven is the uh, self storage text amendment. Uh, Amanda Ayer is here to uh, present it. Thank you, Jim. Good afternoon, commissioners. My name is Amanda Ayer. I work at the Department of City Planning. And I'm here to present a proposed zoning text amendment to require a special permit for new self-storage facilities in certain industrial areas. This proposal aims to support industrial jobs in industrial business zones in New York City. We understand that self-storage facilities have generated concern among communities and industrial advocates. And this proposal aims to strike a balance between protecting the city's most active industrial areas and the real demand that does exist in the city for self-storage, which is already limited as to where it can locate in New York City. This proposal originated in the 10-point industrial action plan, which was announced in November of 2015 by the office of the mayor and the city council. Together, they announced this 10-point industrial action plan, which targets New York City's industrial business zones as areas for employment growth and industrial innovation. The Industrial Action Plan had 10 points, but it had three main objectives. Uh, the first was to protect industrial neighborhoods and incentivize development, industrial development. The restrictions, the proposed restrictions on self-storage are part of this first objective. The second objective was to align city services and to help industrial businesses start, grow, and thrive. 
and the third is to train the city's workforce to meet the needs of the industrial sector. Industrial business zones were first established in 2006. I assume you are somewhat familiar with them in a process that involved city agencies, elected officials, and the public, and the areas were further expanded in 2013. Generally speaking, industrial business zones are New York City's most active industrial areas. As you can see on the map, they uh, exist. They are mapped in all boroughs except for Manhattan. They have, overall, they have over 68% of the employment in these industrial business zones is industrial. They are critical for a range of industries, such as wholesale, stri wholesale trade, construction, transportation, warehousing, and also manufacturing. And we have seen that since 2010, industrial employment has been growing in IBZs, which is a reversal of a few decades uh, of industrial uh, employment losses. The 10-point industrial action plan, which uh, this proposal emanates from, builds on a series of existing policies such as tax incentives and also the establishment of industrial business service providers. And this is a program led by the Department of Small Business Services. The, the IBZ service providers um, help, are, are there to start and grow industrial businesses in these areas. And all of these existing policies for the IBZs support economic and industrial growth in these areas. And the proposed restrictions on self-storage should be understood in this context. Until now, we have been talking about industrial business zones, but uh, this proposal and these industrial businesses principally exist as a tax program and have not yet been incorporated into the zoning resolution as a base for land use decisions. Um, and because that is the case, the Department of City Planning took the I IBZ boundaries and drew zoning boundaries which mirror those IBZ boundaries, and we are calling them designated areas and M districts. I will continue to use this term. They are exactly or almost exactly like the IBZs, but they exclude the airport areas, um, the airport property specifically, and, uh, are, but are otherwise almost exactly the same. A few of the IBZs have very strange uh, boundaries, and we, we had to straighten out, uh, in some of those cases, the boundaries to conform with zoning practices, but they do incorporate the IBZs. <coughs> the proposed designated areas are located in four boroughs. They are M1, M2, or M3 zoned, and the land use is predominantly industrial. The designated areas uh, in M districts will be included in the zoning resolution, would be included in the zoning resolution as text map. The unregulated development of self-storage detracts from the city's long-term goals for the designated areas and M districts. Self-storage uh, generates only very few jobs. According to our analyses, there are about five jobs per facility. <coughs> it serves primarily households, and it tends to occupy those kinds of sites along truck routes, along highways, along arterials, the large sites, which, would, which we see as optimal sites for industrial businesses. Now, regarding the customer base of self-storage, we could only rely on data that we um, found published by the National Self-Storage Association, which says that between 70 and 80 percent of the customers of self-storage are households. This means that between 20 and 30 percent, on average, are leased by businesses. We have heard that these businesses are typically small and that they are often rented by contractors or other self-employed, such as building maintenance contractors who may store building equipment in the self-storage unit, or a pharmaceutical rep who stores samples in these units. Um, this is the extent of information that we have found, essentially, on the users of self-storage. And we have heard that the fact that pri primarily ha households lease self-storage units is also the case uh, for the most part in New York City's self-storage facilities. Uh, this slide shows some examples of recent self-storage development uh, where we think a more job-intensive industrial business could have located. These lots are all very large, and they are well-located for a truck-dependent uh, truck business. And the development of self-storage in locations like these is regarded as a lost opportunity, uh, particularly in the context of all of the existing economic development policies in IBZs, or designated areas in M districts. We also see that self-storage is in high demand, and we expect the industry to continue to expand over the next decade or decades. In the last seven years, uh, there were 10 self-storage developments in designated areas and M districts on sites larger than 20,000 square feet, and this represents about a quarter of new construction and large sites in these areas. 
This means that in the future, more sites with these characteristics would be developed as, could be developed as self-storage when we already know that these sites are increasingly scarce and that industrial businesses have a hard time finding appropriate locations in New York City. Uh, this map shows self-storage facilities in, as they are uh, in New York City. You can see that they exist in all boroughs and that within New York City they are somewhat dispersed, but they do have a pattern of locating along the arterials, as we have already said. Self-storage would be classified today as a use group 16D warehouse. We don't make a differentiation between self-storage and other warehouses currently, and it's permitted as of right in C8 and M districts. One quarter of all existing self-storage facilities today are in the designated areas and M districts. And a number of self-storage facilities are also conversions of uh, non-conforming warehouses that are either in residential or commercial districts. And so if we exclude those conforming legal conversions, then one third of all self-storage facilities are in the designated areas and M districts. The industrial uses that the city desires in IBZs are either job intensive, innovative, they provide utilities and industrial service to New Yorkers, or they support additional economic output and businesses. Because self-storage doesn't generate many jobs and tends to serve households and tends to site on the kinds of sites that would be optimal, industrial, optimal for industrial businesses, we are proposing a city planning commission special permit for the development of new self-storage in designated areas and M districts. We think that a case-by-case -case site-specific review process is necessary to ensure that self-storage development does not represent a significant lost opportunity for the future siting of an industrial, more job-intensive business. The special permit would be required only for self-storage facilities. As you can see here, there are a few pictures, and other warehouses and moving companies would not be included in the special CPC special permit requirement. Those kinds of businesses, so other warehouses or moving companies, typically are more much more job intensive and they also directly support industrial businesses. Warehousing is, we see that it is an essential component of what happens in IBZs and we, we don't want to uh, apply a restriction on those kinds of businesses. Now self-storage, unlike other storage or warehousing options, does not create a bailment. This means that a self-storage operation does not take custody of the goods that are within its facility. And that is something that sets self-storage principally apart from other uh, warehouses. Uh, we are proposing to define self-storage in the zoning resolution, and this would be under Section 1210. I would like to read to you the proposed definition, and this is word for word from our uh, proposed zoning text. A self-service storage facility is a storage office use or a warehouse use listed in use group 16D for the purpose of storing personal property, where such, and here there are two options, either the facility is partitioned into individual securely subdivided spaces for lease, these are the typical cubicles that you imagine, or the facility consists of enclosed or unenclosed floor space that is subdivided by secured, by secured bins, boxes, containers, pods, or other mobile or stationary devices. So if those subdivisions were not the typical cubicles, but were small containers stacked onto one another, there could be those two differences. And in either case, um, the floor spaces or storage divide devices would need to be less than 300 square feet in area, which is a fairly large room, and would need to be leased or rented to persons or businesses to access, store, and remove self property on a self-service basis. So the self-service basis, again, is key here in setting a self-storage apart from other, from other warehouses. At the Department of City Planning, we work together with the Department of Buildings in crafting this definition. In designated areas and M districts, self-storage development would be permitted by special <laughs> permit on sites that wouldn't be appropriate industrial business locations. So the City Planning Commission would need to find that a lot or building would be impractic impractical for conforming industrial uses based on a series of considerations, and we would include those considerations in the, zoning in the zoning text and then describe the considerations in more detail in uh, the CPC report. But the considerations would amount to uh, a few different ones and it includes zoning lot size. So we know that um, the protection or, yeah, the protection of large sites for industrial businesses is very important. So a smaller site might be appropriate for a self-storage facility. We, 
the city planning commission would be asked to look at the lot or building configuration. Many cell storage facilities are conversions. So in the case of a conversion, um, if the uh, building had, does it have loading docks? Does it have appropriate column spacing? What about the floor loads? Does it have freight elevators? These are questions that would be significant uh, in order to determine whether an industrial business would likely occupy such a site or not. Is the proposed site close to truck routes, existing truck routes? What does the local street look like that, that um, provides access to the lot? Is it narrow? Is it wide? Could it handle truck dependent, the truck dependent use? Also, if there has been any investment in comparable sites in the area, are there uh, vacancies, are there abandoned buildings, or, all are, are, or are the buildings uh, generally actively used and occupied? Uh, furthermore, the need for environmental re remediation of a site, if a, a site is contaminated, we, we might rather see a self-storage facility um, clean it up and, and get, bit, get built on there instead of um, having it sit vacant or contaminated and wait for a... For a a more job-intensive industrial business to come and develop it, and also the potential for conflict between potential industrial uses and existing uses in the surrounding area. If we're thinking of the case of grandfathered uh, residential uses that might be adjacent to a proposed site or a community facility, we might not want to see a more uh, in intense industrial use on such a site uh, if there are already residential uses nearby. We're proposing that existing self-storage facilities would be grandfathered and extensions and enlargements um, of the self-storage facility would be permitted within the original zoning lot as a date of enactment. This is mainly uh, to ensure that for minor modification self-storage facilities, pre-existing self-storage facilities wouldn't need to um, obtain a special permit for those uh, very minor modifications. Uh, this sums up the proposed action. We uh, worked on a draft environmental impact statement that was completed, and a, we had the positive issued, sorry, the positive declaration issued on March 1st, and the scoping meeting was held on March 30th. The draft EIS chapters with potential for significant adverse impacts are the socioeconomic conditions, and uh, specifically, this self, this proposed text amendment could um, has the potential for significant adverse impact on the self storage industry. And the other two chapters are historic and cultural resources and hazardous materials. And this is mainly due to the generic and almost citywide uh, nature of the proposed action. Certain significant adverse impacts couldn't be entirely ruled out. Thank you for your attention. And let me know if you have questions. Thank you, Amanda. And I do want to note that obviously the city plan Department of City Planning staff works hard on private applications, on our neighborhood rezonings. But a proposal of this type that covers so many different areas of the city is particularly challenging and labor intensive. So I wanted to publicly acknowledge the work of the team in getting this to this point. And now questions from the commissioners. Commissioner Cirillo. Thank you, Madam Chair. So I want to take a step a little bit out of the weeds. I feel like I'm, I'm, I've gotten deep in here. And I just want to understand sort of globally what we're attempting to accomplish, mm -hmm. I mean, I know the ultimate goal, but how far we're going, because that's not clear to me. Mm -hmm. So I understand what we're doing in what we will call the designated areas, which, and correct me if I'm wrong, will be the areas that mirror the IBZ areas, in the M, okay. I have a question there. Does any part of this apply to a non-IBZ area where in an M, non-IBZ M, a storage facility can be built? Is, is, this, it's, is it two-prong, or is this only because it feels like the criteria we're, we're dealing with a sort of a category, and then we sort of lose the category language. So I, I just want to make sure I'm no, understanding. No, I, I, if I understand you correctly, I think that is correct. So correct. this is so, it only a, this definition and the restriction and the requirement for a CPC special permit would only apply in designated areas and M districts. OK. And these are those are the IBZ, so they're these areas. And outside of these areas, there is no special permit. There wouldn't be a special permit requirement. OK. And, only IBZ areas have been covered by this proposal. Now there may be a lot or two on the fringes that, in order by straightening out, but that's 
That's good. That's an excellent clarification. Thank you. That's, it was unclear to me if there was any part of this that was addressing sort of the industry and the use beyond the IBC. No. Okay. So then I guess the, the question that I sort of get from this, because now I can, be, I can limit it, which is sort of interesting, and it, in, in a way it reminds me of the discussions we have with, um, with looking at sort of the criteria for rental rates and manufacturing and so, which is the idea that there's criteria to determine whether or not, I mean, um, let me find the, the language that, we, that was in the presentation, a case-by-case -case site-specific review that will ensure that self-storage development does not represent a significant lost opportunity for future siting of an industrial, more job-intensive business. So given the fact that we already have data that shows that this industry is a, let's say it is not, <laughs> doesn't create significant job opportunities, what are we going to look at that could ever possibly overcome that standard to say that a potential industrial job would be less, could be, I guess there's very small industrial opportunities, but when we're talking about an average employment job creation rate of five, are we creating one of those situations where we're just sitting here and we're analyzing this data and we're just kind of guessing and we're determining whether or not this is a smart place for it or not, or are we really going to end up using data that will matter? so that we don't create a process while we're trying to fix others that we've stumbled on that are similar, that we're not really making the determination we are expected to make in the, in the citing process. Mm -hmm. I know it's a, it's, it, it's a it debatable discussion. It's a discussion that's bigger than a, a yes or a no answer, but I just wonder how we will craft that analysis and what we will use to determine up, but it's not like we're taking this specific industrial job versus this specific siting of a, of a thing. It's a potential industrial job. Well, what is potential? Is it a, if it's a 50 in, a person business, well, clearly it, it tilts the scales away from a, a storage facility. But if it's one, person, then maybe the storage facility is four more jobs or six more jobs. So I just wonder how we think that through as we look ahead at this. If I might, uh, Commissioner Cirillo, because this is something that we had discussed internally, okay. trying to get a handle on did we think we were going to see a hundred of these applications a year. Um, we in our draft environmental impact statement assume that we'll receive one application a year because um, 51 percent of M zone land will be outside of these designated areas and so there will be the ability to site a self storage facility there without a special permit okay um, so one can imagine that the operators might choose to go there <laughs> the second is the special permit findings which allow the case by case and there um, there's one that Amanda highlighted um, the need for environmental remediation that mm -hmm. that clearly could be a factor, our desire to see land remediated, and if the self-storage facility were to come forward, the benefit, um, the land use benefit from having the prompt remediation okay. could be a factor. A second is the proximity to truck routes. Mm -hmm. And if there are, are lots within IBZs that are not proximate to truck routes and that might be more appropriate for a lower intensity use mm -hmm. with fewer employees. Those could be the, okay. the types of factors. So I don't think we are either creating a um, new business line um, for a massive number of special permits, but nor are we creating the null set. Okay, well, that's it's very helpful. I really appreciate that. I mean, and I know that we will learn, you know, if, if, if this is the process that is, you know, approved at the end, that we will learn with experience as well. But, but that insight is very helpful. But also, thank you. If, if I may add, um, the, you know, so these, the IBCs, and we have studied employment there, and industrial employment has been growing, and they are New York City's strongest industrial areas. So we do think that there is 
that it is likely that if a cell, like that in the optimal sites, if a self-storage facility weren't built there, it is likely that an industrial business would actually take up those sites because it has all the characteristics that we know industrial businesses typically seek out. Mm -hmm. So when you're talking about the potential, it, it, it's not only potential, it's actually, we think it would be likely for an industrial businesses to, for an industrial business to site on a location that doesn't that doesn't follow these these findings mm -hmm. or that um, uh, yeah I, and I get I get that on on you know in the process I just I just always feel like there's something about the we have a you know we, we will always be dealing with this with a specific application mm -hmm. before us and then the the speculation or expectation which is not as much real it is perhaps hopeful and two possible and then how do we balance that and what what ends up being our process at the mm -hmm. at, in that it's not it's not easy and it's not clear and i mean a lot of that is true in other things but i just it it, it triggered that sort of feeling as other things we analyze and i i wondered at the beginning do we end up creating that but i guess based on the other criteria and based on um the fact that we'll you know learn as we go along too and the fact that we won't be overwhelmed with these to the same degree uh, based on the limited sort of scope of, of what we're addressing here. So I, I appreciate all the, all the information and comments. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, and if, just to follow up on that, I'm assuming the way this would work is a landlord or storage facility will make an application to us and they will try to make the argument as to why that site is not suitable for manufacturing mm -hmm. and why it's you know far away from truck routes and all these other things. The mm -hmm. negative, basically. Yeah. Um, and it make the case for why this site is suitable for this type of use, and we'll have to weigh weigh that argument. I, I guess one question also I have is, in a situation, I guess it may be taken up by the investment in comparable sites in the vicinity. Is you have somebody who's trying to sell a site, let's say, and a storage facility is a willing buyer and they come to us with this special permit, and the seller says, look, I've tried to sell it for the past two years, and this is the only willing buyer I have found. How do we handle that situation, or how do you think we look at that situation, mm -hmm. even given the criteria here? Yeah, um, and, and we, don't, we don't think it's reasonable to, to have, or, or yeah, necessarily reasonable to have a, uh, um, a site sit vacant if there is no interest in developing it by an industrial business, and if even if it's in the IBZ, and although those areas in general have seen job employment growth and have seen um, more businesses move in, industrial businesses move in, if if the area was characterized by abandonment or by um, a lack of interest in in development, um, we think if the, if if an applicant could make the argument convincingly that there aren't any alternatives, viable alternatives uh, to, to developing this site, and not for there has been no interest by any, by job-intensive industrial businesses, then uh, that would be a, a basis for granting this. Just to make it a little more complicated. Mm -hmm. in, a situa in a situation where there may have been other buyers, but no one else willing to pay the price exactly. they were asking. <laughs> just, I mean, it's, it goes it's back to the, what space. we find with the conversion of space into retail. Yeah. I mean, so exactly. It's, a, it's exactly the same situation. It will always be because it's cheap. And so I, I just throw it out there rhetorically because I'm not sure how we... No, this is something we, th we should think further yeah. about and yeah. um, should provide further guidance on as well. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yes, Commissioner Efron. Thank you. I loved your list of criteria because that really should be, in my opinion, the standard that we as city agencies have for actually leasing space in IBCs, but that's a separate conversation. <laughs> <laughs> but it's nice to have a list. Um, I wondered if there was any consideration to engage consumer affairs with this proposal, since um, though it's not a land use question, but you have presented something um, that really has possible consequences outside of land use. Um, I, I am a bit concerned that uh, with a more limited market of self-storage, um, there might be a large increase in the cost of self-storage. And I'm not quite as convinced um, that the fact that it's 80% residential is necessarily a bad thing, since we don't distinguish 
for manufacturers who sell to individuals versus manufacturers who sell to uh, retail establishments. Um, and I'm not sure we should care if the end user mm -hmm. is an individual versus um, a business only in that uh, if it's a business relatively nearby involved in manufacturing and then there would be um, almost a supply chain need for that use. But I am concerned about the um, cost of storage. And as I understand it, a lot of um, a lot of um, moving companies have storage, yes. and the difference is that their people, more employees, retrieve the goods rather than the self-storage. But for the consumer, it's a significant cost increase to mm -hmm. have non-self-storage versus self-storage. Mm -hmm. And that particularly, um, as apartments are getting smaller, seems like something we should concern ourselves with about the quality of life and the cost of, um, uh, of living in New York. Um, so I just wonder if there's any economic analysis or any thought about how to go on. No, that's an interesting point. Um, we have, uh, we have for the, in, the, in looking at the DIS, it's, it's it, we, can, we could not exclude that self-storage units, the leasing of those would, would get a little bit more expensive. We do think that there is, that there is opportunity for growth in, in the MNC8 areas that are not designated areas, so where the development of self-storage could still occur as of right. But, but it, is, it is hard to see into the future and, and, and know what, how, how things could change. There are also some other storage models that are out there. Um, we, have looked in, or we have looked at on-demand storage, which is this model where they come and come pick up your belongings, and they usually have their warehouses in New Jersey because they don't, they don't rely on the access part. So they, like a moving company, they take custody of the goods and they bring them off site. And if, if someone needed them again, they call and they get re-delivered to the house. And it's, it's, I understand it's a different model than self-storage and that necessarily not everybody could shift from a, leasing a self-storage unit to the on-demand model, but it is also an alternative that, that exists and is available to, to, to households um, for the more occasional access it need. One more question. Um, under this plan, would a current self-storage company owner operator be allowed to sell to another self-storage operator or would they be restricted in a transfer? No, the use would be non-conforming and, and, um, but grandfathered, so I, I don't see an issue with that. I hope I'm not giving a wrong answer. But. And could expand on the same zoning lot. I knew they could expand. I just wasn't sure if, if they could If sell. under build, the, the facility could still expand. Commissioner Ortiz. Hi. You know, back, back to the, the questions uh, posed by Commissioner Edie. Do we know... Um, yeah, I guess this all gets down to land value, right? Um, you know, we often have requests for, uh, you know, someone mentioned SOHO, the use group six um, requests that uh, hinge on, um, you know, the ability to, to make a profit as a result of a, you know, high valuation. Um, and if you think you're going to get the special permit, you might pay for property, you know, you might pay more for property and then you turn around and you say, well, I need um, this particular use in order to make myself whole. Do we know, uh, you know, what the premium is for uh, these storage units? Um, you know, how much cash flow in general um, they are providing for an owner over these other industrial uses? Because, I mean, in Soho, it's, uh, I don't know, $40 for manufacturing to $400 for retail. You know, it, it doesn't it no longer makes economic sense. And, and these spaces monetize every single vertical square foot. Um, so I, I, I would think that's important for, <laughs> yeah, that's really important for us because otherwise we're setting ourselves up for something that's purely procedural um, rather than a, a meaningful special permit. We definitely have some information on the rents per square foot of self-storage. If I can, I would like to just follow up with that. Um, yeah. We don't know how much sales necessarily go for, but we could also see if there's additional research we can do for that. But in terms of the, the, the difference in square, the price per square foot that, um, that, that, we can, that we can give you. Thank you. Commissioner Levin. Yeah, just to follow up on that, I would like to know more about why um, the industrial uses that we seek to have mm -hmm aren't taking up these spaces. I mean, threaded through our discussion here and through some of the information in the 
environmental work is essentially the argument that self-storage spaces are gentrifying forces in IBZs, that they are um, paying higher prices for land than the intended manufacturing uses can pay. I'd like to, you've, you've articulately explained why self-storage uses aren't desirable, but why is the market not self-regulating? I think as we consider this through the public review process, I'd like to understand a little bit more about that, why we need the hand of government to shape the market in the IBCs. Commissioner Delarose. Those are all great questions that fellow commissioners have, have raised. Um, the, you know, in this particular case, what's interesting, too, is that the IBZs are run by organizations that have a lot of information about what's going on in the IBZs. And I'm just wondering how we might build that into the special permit findings. Um, you know, for instance, I don't know if investment in comparable sites in the vicinity covers what the overall vacancy rate is within the IBZ or not. And it would also be helpful, I think, to kind of have an understanding of what are the different types of uses that are happening within an IBZ, to Commissioner Levin's point. Mm -hmm. um, besides self-storage facilities, there are a lot of other uses. Obviously, we have the hotel conversation, which is happening. But there are a lot of other uses which impact the price um, in manufacturing districts, including IBZs in particular, um, nightclubs, entertainment type uses, which pay much more than traditional in uh, industrial uses. So I think those might be helpful, I think, to kind of round out the special permit findings conversation. And I'm sure we'll hear more about that as this goes through the, the discussion. Yeah. Yes, Commissioner Levin. I'm sorry, I just had one other, one other thought cross my mind. This is a very unusual special permit. It doesn't have findings. It has things that we're going to consider. Yes. So an applicant is put in the opposite position of having to argue against itself. Usually, mm -hmm. and Commissioner Edie alluded to this, um, most other special permits, the ap applicant comes in with a statement of findings that expresses its best case why its proposed use should be allowed. Um, here it's going to have to go the opposite direction, and we're not asking them to make findings. So how does that work? Do we have other special permits where we only ask for, where we're given our own considerations, we're not asking the applicant to tell us what we can find. It's, it has a very different and kind of negative, twisted negative flavor to it that is unusual, I think, for special permits. Yes, I, I, I don't think there is another special permit that is written in this way, so that, that is the case. The, the finding that we are proposing is that it is not appropriate for conforming industrial use as mm -hmm. the finding, one single finding, and then consideration. But it is not um, the way any other special permits yeah. are phrased. We've got to be careful about that. Yes, Commissioner Arfon. In having a change to the IBZ um, understanding or written documentation around IBZs, I think it might be important, because we're almost there, but we never do that, to talk about um, <coughs> Uh, the first priority should be manufacturing jobs. And I think being explicit about that seems really important right now, um, especially as warehouse uh, becomes uh, a bigger use given the retail situation. And I, I just think we're stopping short of that, and this seems like a really important opportunity to acknowledge that as a land use goal. Commissioner Eady. Just, just for clarification, this doesn't preclude a business putting a where warehouse for their own use in no. this space, correct? No, okay. we, we are yeah, intentionally okay. not trying to write a definition that does not include um, yeah. that kind it's of use. It's only self-storage. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Other comments? Well, thank you. This has been very, very helpful, having this additional input into the thinking that we've already done on this. And this item will now be referred to the community board and the borough president for 60 days. I don't so how many community boards? <laughs> Item number eight on page 147 of your package, 19302, Horace Harding Expressway. Uh, is a modification to a previously approved special permit. Stephen Everett of the Queen's Office will tell you about it. Good afternoon again, Chair Lago, and good afternoon again, Commissioners. This project area is located in Queen's Community District 8, 
along the Horse Harding and Long Island Expressways, which divide District 8 to the south from District 11 to the north. Immediately west of this project area is the Fresh Meadows Shopping Center, and to the south is the Fresh Meadows Planned Community. Farther west in District 7 is Consina Park, with a portion of the Consina Park corridor connecting it to Cunningham Park, which is Community District 8's largest park. The project area consists of Block 7117, Lot 189, again located on the south side of Horse Harding Expressway. It's developed with an existing five-story building with ground floor residential and commercial, and floor, four floors of apartments above. East of the development site is a branch of the Queens Public Library, and west is again the Fresh Meadow Shopping Center with a USPS distribution facility here, a movie theater, and various restaurants and retail facilities with parking. The Fresh Meadows Garden Apartment Community to the south consists of 251 dwelling units located in two and three story apartment buildings. The development was mapped in 1974 with a special district to establish a planned community to protect the existing layout of that garden apartment community. North of Horace Harding and the Long Island Expressway is again the Casina Park Corridor, which bisects an existing R2A district, established in 2010 as a function of the Auburndale Oakland Gardens Hollis Hills rezoning. The purpose of that which was to protect the low density character of these neighborhoods. Along Horace Harding Expressway on the north side are two houses of worship and some retail that, that continues west um, off the extent of the map here. Again, the site is currently built with an existing five-story building. There are four floors of apartments above, and the ground floor includes a USPS retail location and a real estate management office and the superintendent's unit. So looking at the site, it is, the building is located to the right here. This is Horse Harding Expressway, again here, and we're looking at the front of the building here. It's located in the left on these photographs with the Queens Public Library in the foreground here. The, the front of the building shows that uh, the main entrance for the superintendent's unit, the real estate management office, and the retail USPS location is off of Horse Harding. And if you look north from Horse Harding, you see the Long Island Expressway in the center here with, an, with Horse Harding again on the north side of that. The rear of the building, shown here, as existing recreational space in the rear. And again, in the foreground here would be the branch of the Queens Public Library. The building was originally developed pursuant to a rezoning from R4 in the PC district to C42, which is the same zoning district mapped within the Fresh Meadow Shopping Center, as well as a special permit pursuant to the housing quality regulations. A restricted declaration was enacted to restrict uses within the building to those allowed by the special permit. And currently, a 1,180 foot square foot real estate management office is a permitted use on the ground floor, and no other use can take its place without modifying the special permit and restricted declaration. According to the applicants, the management office outgrew this space, and it is now vacant. Therefore, they propose a modification to the special permit to eliminate the real estate management office from the ground floor and establish in its place a two-bedroom apartment of the exact same square footage, which again is 1,180 square feet. The site plan of the ground floor shows that this is the USPS facility, this is the superintendent's unit with common recreation and bulk storage, and shown here is the existing vacant real estate management office. So they propose to remove that and establish in its place a two-bedroom apartment of 1,180 square feet while rearranging the common recreation and storage space to the front of the building. Thank you. Questions from the commission? Nice change of pace from the prior one. <laughs> um, if no comments, then we'll refer this to the community board, just one community board for 45 days. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Item number nine on page 185 of your package is the Broad Channel Resiliency Rezoning. This is coming back to public hearing on 
Wednesday and it's to establish a special coastal risk district in Broad Channel. Um, Mary Kimball of the Waterfront is making the presentation. Hello, thank you. Um, my name is Mary Kimball. I'm uh, subbing on behalf of uh, Marissa Hurlitz, the project manager who wasn't able to attend today. Um, so the Broad Channel and Hamilton Beach Resiliency Rezonings, both these are certified by the City Planning Commission on February 21st. And really the, the goal of both of these proposals is to limit densities in these areas due to the exceptional flood risk that they face. Um, first up, Broad Channel. Um, this rezoning includes a zoning map amendment and zoning text amendment as well. Um, here's where Broad Channel is located. It's in the middle of Jamaica Bay within Queens Community District 14. The area is currently zoned R32, which allows all residential building types. Um, and the zoning designation really doesn't match the existing conditions, which is predominantly single-family detached homes on narrow lots. Uh, there's also a small commercial over uh, com commercial node on Cross Bay Boulevard, uh, where there is a C12 commercial overlay. Uh, this area experiences regular tidal flooding today, um, even from minor st coastal storms or from a monthly high tides. And these conditions are projected to worsen in the future. Um, due to sea level rise, this match is showing um, a range of projections for the 2050s. I'm looking at various scenarios of climate change in the areas that would be impacted. So over the past several years, we've been working with the community board as well as local civics to develop a proposal for this area to address the, uh, the high risks in the neighborhood. Um, and we are proposing a, a special coastal risk district. Um, this would be created in the zoning resolution and then a sub-district of this district would be mapped in broad channel. Um, and this would modify the underlying zoning to limit future residential development purely to single-family uh, detached homes. And it would also prohibit community facilities with sleeping or overnight accommodations, um, such as nursing homes. Um, this is to limit vulnerable populations from moving into the area. Uh, in addition, the proposal includes a zoning map amendment to rezone most of Broad Channel um, to, from R32 to R3A, which will better match the existing conditions of the neighborhood. Um, which will allow for better um, and more resilient new development to happen. Um, and this would, of course, be modified by the Special Coastal Risk District that I just described. In addition, we're proposing a zoning map amendment on the Southeast Shore Broad Channel from R32 to C3A. And this would bring the existing uh, marinas in the area into conformance um, and better support their ongoing resiliency there. Um, the C3A has a residential equivalent of R3A, so the same residential um, Regulations apply, although it would also be modified by the special district. Um, in addition, we're proposing to update the existing commercial overlay from C12 to C13. This has a, a lower um, parking requirement, um, would better reflect the, the needs of the area, um, and also allow for those um, commercial businesses to be rebuilt in the future um, were they damaged by a future storm. Uh, so as I said, it was certified on February 21st. Community Board 14 held a public hearing on April 19th, uh, voted unanimously to approve. Queens Borough President held a public hearing on April 27th and also issued a letter in support. Um, I'll go on to the uh, Hamilton Beach unless there's any questions. Okay, All so right. Hamilton Beach. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, so Hamilton Beach, um, this rezoning also includes a zoning map amendment and zoning text amendment. It was also certified on the 21st. There's a location where Hamilton Beach is located, um, also along Jamaica Bay um, in Community District 10 in Queens, however, um, and is located next to JFK Airport. The area is currently zoned R31. Um, this allows one and two family detached and semi-detached residences. Uh, in recent years, we've seen a lot of new development of semi-detached two-family homes um, on the vacant lots there, um, although the, the older historic context is really similar to Broad Channel uh, single-family detached homes on narrow lots. Um, in addition, uh, there's a commercial node Coleman Square, which will get by the air train stop, uh, which has a C12 commercial overlay. And like Broad Channel, Hamilton Beach experiences regular tidal flooding today. This condition is expected to worsen over time with sea level rise. Um, this map is also showing 2050s. Um, and here's a, it's a photo of sort of the type of flooding that occurs uh, quite frequently from even smaller storms. Um, so also as, as part of the um, project in Broad Channel, we've been working um, with this neighborhood in Hamilton Beach, um, along with the community board and civics to craft this proposal. 
um, and are also proposing to apply another special coastal risk district in this area. Um, this one is a slightly different um, subdistrict. It would predominantly allow only single family detached homes, but on lots that are 40 feet or wider, it would allow two family detached homes. And likewise, it would also prohibit community facilities with sleeping or overnight accommodations like nursing homes. Uh, also, there is a proposal for underlining zoning change from R31 um, again to R3A, which uh, again establishes an envelope more in keeping with the existing conditions in order to allow for resilience upgrades and investments to existing homes. Um, uh, and then, yeah, this district though would also be modified by the special coastal risk district. Um, and then also similarly to Broad Channel, but in Coleman Square, um, are also proposing to um, change the commercial overlay from C12 to C13, again, to lower the requirements to better support the existing businesses that are there. So uh, this proposal was also certified um, on February 21st. There was a public hearing by Community Board 10 on April 6th, uh, which adopted it, uh, approved it unanimously. Uh, Queensboro President also had a public hearing on April 27th and also issued a recommendation to approve. I think any questions on this one or either proposal? Any questions from the commissioners? If not, then this will go to a public hearing on Wednesday. Both of these applications have received strong um, support from the community board and the borough press. We would propose to bring them for vote in two weeks on June 7th. We will wait until after the public hearing to see what we learn at the public hearing, but I will note that there is a strong interest from the community board and the elected officials to see this move through quickly, but let's not make the determination until after Wednesday. Then our next item is on is item number 12, uh, 62 Green Street, page uh, 327 of your package. It's a special permit to allow use group six uses on the ground floor uh, of an existing building in Manhattan. It's coming back for public hearing, and Sylvia Lee is here to make the presentation. Good afternoon, Chair Lago, Commissioner. This is a, pri uh, this is a private application by 62 Green owners returning as a pre-hearing item after review by Manhattan Community Board 2 and Manhattan Borough President. Both CB2 and the Borough President recommended approval of the application with conditions. I'll first provide an overview of the project. You may recall that the applicant, 62 owners, Corp, requests the grant of a landmark preservation special permit under 74711 to allow use for six retail use on portions of the ground floor and cellar of an existing five-story building located at 62 Green Street within an M15A zoning district in the Soho Cast Iron Historic District, Manhattan Community District 2. As shown on the area map, the project site is located on the east side of Spring Street between Broome and Spring Streets in the Soho neighborhood of Manhattan. The project site is located within an M15A district, which permit light, uh, permits light industrial and commercial uses up to 5 FAR and community facility uses up to 6.5 FAR in M15A district, use group six retail use is not permitted below the level of second story for buildings occupying lot, uh, lot over 3,600 square feet. The surrounding Soho neighborhood buildings typically range from three to seven stories in height, consisting of cast iron elevator buildings and low rise brick walk up apartment buildings. Buildings along Green Street and the Soho neighborhood typically house retail stores, art galleries, eating and drinking establishments, furniture showrooms, and wholesalers on the ground floors. As shown in these photos, um, this stretch of Spring Street between Broome and Spring Streets have consistent heights and cast iron facades. Green Street, 62 Green Street, shown here. As shown in the site plan, the subject zoning lot measures approximately 4,800 square feet in lot area. The site is improved with a five-story building that was constructed for industrial use in approximately 1881. The upper floors of the building were converted to a joint living work with artists in 1981 with four units and have been occupied since. So since. Um, the ground floor has been leased for um, the last eight years to Trespa North <coughs> America for the sale of architecture building materials, a conforming use in use group 16. The lease expires September 2017 and the tenant has informed the applicant that it does not intend to renew its lease. The applicant proposes to use uh, 6,102 gross square feet on portions of the ground floor and cellar for use group six commercial retail use. 
including 2,029 gross square feet in the cellar and 4,073 zoning square feet on the ground floor. Other aspects of the building will remain unchanged. The proposed development also includes a comprehensive restoration of the facade, storefront, window elements, and masonry party walls as identified in the LPC approved restoration plan. A long-term maintenance program has also been established to ensure the preservation of the building in perpetuity. Section 7411 allows the commission to modify use regulations provided that certain conditions regarding historic preservation are met and the outlined findings can be made. The application was certified and referred out on March 6, 2017. At its full board meeting on April 20, 2017, Manhattan Community Board 2 adopted a resolution recommending approval of the application with the condition that there be no eating and drinking permit. Um, on May 19, 2017, the Manhattan Borough President issued a recommendation to approve the application under the condition that no eating and drinking establishment occupy the ground floor and cellar space, and under the condition that the applicant make a serious effort to work with the Department of Cultural Affairs and EDC's Made in New York program to connect with cultural and creative organizations of the subject state. Um, that's it for the presentation. Happy to answer any questions. Questions from commissioners? Okay, then this will go to a public hearing on Wednesday. Thank you. We'll come back to the heliport and uh, go to item number 14, the uh, <laughs> Department of Sanitation District 11 garage on page 399 of your package. Uh, this is an amendment to the Harlem East Harlem Burn Renewal Plan, as well as site selection and acquisition of properties to facilitate the relocation of the Manhattan 11 garage and uh, lot cleaning unit. I know that you received a package of letters uh, in your weekend package, and they still keep on coming. Um, so uh, it should be an interesting hearing. Uh, Ed Edwin Marshall is here to uh, make the presentation. Good afternoon, Chair Lago. Good afternoon, Commissioners. The Department of Sanitation is seeking to relocate its Manhattan District 11 garage and lot cleaning unit headquarters to a location located at 207 to 217 East 127th Street. The site is located within East Harlem, Manhattan Community District 11. The requested actions are a site selection and acquisition by lease. The Department of Sanitation and the Department of Citywide Administrative Services are co-applicants for this application. And also, since the site is located on an urban renewal site, Site 16A within the Harlem East Harlem Urban Renewal Area, your urban renewal plan is being amended to redesignate the site from a material recycling facility to light industrial uses. This new designation is more compatible with what the Department of Sanitation is proposing for the proposed acquisition site. The project site uh, is outlined in the red on this image right here. It's located uh, in the mid-block that is bounded by East 127th and East 128th Streets uh, between 2nd and 3rd Avenues. The project objectives are fairly straightforward. The Department of Sanitation wants to relocate its existing Manhattan District 11 garage, which is located on East 99th Street, to the site located on 127th Street. And also, they want to relocate their lot uh, cleaning unit headquarters from their location at East 123rd Street to the site on East 127th Street. So this is an image that shows the existing Manhattan 11 District Garage. Uh, the site is located on the north side of East 99th Street between 1st Avenue and 2nd Avenue. It comprises um, a two-story garage uh, that has 18,000 square feet of floor area. The garage is owned by the Health and Hospitals Corporation, but it is leased by the Department of Sanitation. Sanitation has leased this uh, garage since 1968. Along First Avenue, uh, there's a, a vacant land assemblage that has about 15,000 square feet of a lot area. You can see the trucks parked here. And also, uh, to the south of the site, uh, on the opposite side of 99th Street, we have the Metropolitan Hospital campus. Uh, you can see some public housing located here and new housing construction located uh, north on 100th Street. This is an image that shows uh, a deeper dive of the existing built condition. Uh, you can see uh, the two-story garage, which is leased from Health and Hospitals by Sanitation. You can see the vacant land assemblage that's used for vehicle parking. Uh, this building is in very, very poor condition. The second floor is not usable. As a result, uh, equipment is parked on the street as well as ancillary support equipment like snow plows, 
and other types of equipment that sanitation uses to perform its service delivery operations within Community District 11. The lot cleaning unit is located on 123rd Street uh, between 3rd Avenue and Lexington Avenue. It comprises a vacant land assemblage, which is city-owned, which is about 19,000 square feet. Uh, this is managed by sanitation. It's owned by sanitation, and they will continue to hold on to this. And there is a three-story uh, office building, which is privately owned, uh, that sanitation leases from a private owner uh, for the light cleaning unit headquarters. This is an image that shows uh, the existing built condition. Uh, you can see uh, the city-owned vacant land assemblage located here. You can see the sanitation vehicles parked here. And you can see the three-story building uh, that's leased by sanitation, again, for office space for the lot cleaning unit. So the project site located on 127th Street between 2nd and 3rd Avenues uh, is about 48,000 square feet of lot area. It comprises a 24,000 square foot paved parking area and also a three-story office building that has a little bit more than 91,000 square feet. This is an area map. Uh, the site is located right here. It's located within an M31 zoning district that allows heavy manufacturing uses. Uh, as part of this project, the urban renewal plan is being amended to only allow light manufacturing uses. So although the site is zoned M31, heavy manufacturing uses will not be permitted here as per the urban renewal plan. Uh, you can see Harlem River Park located directly to the north. Crackers Whack Park is located to the northeast right here. And there's a public school located directly to the east. There's some churches located here. And you can see residential development uh, just east of Lexington Avenue and Park Avenue uh, located right here. This is an aerial image that shows the proposed garage site. Uh, you can see uh, the, the acquisition site outlined in the yellow. This is the existing 91,000 square foot building, and this is the paved parking area, which is 24,000 square feet. The commission will notice that there are some vehicles parked here. These are assessor ride vans, and they will be uh, placed on this lot right here. Uh, the rest of the block is developed by the Potamkin Auto Dealership, where you have Hyundai and Mitsubishi cars sold here, which is located in the eastern portion of the block. And again, as I said in my previous remarks, there are churches which are all located on the western portion of the block. This is a view uh, looking north of 127th Street. You can see the existing built condition of the proposed acquisition site. And this is a view looking south from 128th Street. Again, you can see the existing built condition of the proposed acquisition. So this is a proposed layout, uh, just to orient the commission. This is 127th Street. This is 128th Street. This is the existing three-story building, which has 91,000 square feet and change. Uh, as part of this project, uh, there will be a proposed addition of about 8,700 square feet. This will be built by the owner of the Camkin. It will be built uh, by him, and he will be compensated for that. Uh, and then this here is the space that's open to the sky. Uh, there are 22 collection uh, trucks that are parked here. These are collection trucks. Uh, there are 22 that are parked here. There are two front end loaders. These two are front end loaders, which are parked here. So you have 22 collection trucks and two front end loaders. Within the enclosed addition, you have four salt spreaders, one, two, three, four, two front end loaders, and there are two additional uh, collection trucks uh, that will be parked uh, within the garage as well. So in total, there'll be uh, about 24 collection trucks, four salt spreaders, and four uh, front end loaders. Additionally, within the existing building, there's rooftop parking, uh, light utility vehicles, uh, SUVs, and cars that are used by sanitation staff, official vehicles will be parked on the roof of this building. So in total, there'll be 41 vehicles parked at this facility. None will be parked on the street. So this is a three-shift operation. This is a 24-hour facility. Uh, however, Wednesday is the peak day of operation. Uh, I want to make a slight correction here. Not 16 collection trucks, but 14 collection trucks will exit at the peak hour between 6 and 6.30 a.m. on Wednesday. And this is a map that shows the routes within the community. Everything in pink are the area within Community District 11 that will receive collection services Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. And the area in blue are areas within Community District 11 that will receive collection services on Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday. The trucks will leave the proposed uh, facility uh, heading south on 2nd Avenue and will return north on 3rd Avenue. 
And these are images that show uh, what it would look like just to orient the commission. This is 127th Street. It's one way heading east uh, towards the river. This is the uh, space where the collection trucks will be parked. It is not roofed. It is open to the sky. It has three roll-down gates. And you can see the existing building where uh, the lot cleaning unit headquarters would be headquartered. And on the roof of this building, the smaller light utility vehicles would be placed. This is an image showing uh, the frontage along 128th Street. 128th Street also is one way heading eastbound. Uh, this is the northern facade of the lot cleaning unit um, headquarters building, uh, the building that will be repurposed for lot cleaning unit headquarters. And you can see the three roll down gates uh, where the trucks would enter into uh, the storage area. And again, it's open to the sky. So these applications were certified on February 21st, 2017. Uh, on April 18th, 2017, uh, Manhattan Community Board 11, by a vote of 27 in favor, one opposed, and two abstaining, adopted uh, a recommendation, a resolution to disapprove these applications. Uh, they stated a number of issues, which I'll go through very, very briefly. Um, one issue uh, was the placement of an additional sanitation facility. Uh, as the commission knows, uh, the placement of these types of facilities has been a long-standing concern in, in the upper Manhattan communities, Harlem, East Harlem, uh, Inwood, I mentioned a few. And the uh, Community Board of Eleven basically reiterated that, underscored that concern. Uh, the board also had concern about truck and traffic movement through the community. The commission saw how the trucks would travel through uh, this community going to and from the garage. It was a concern by the community board. Uh, the surrounding area has several schools, parks, churches, and other community facilities, and the community board uh, expressed some concern about the proximity of these uses to the proposed acquisition site. And also, um, the surrounding area has uh, some new development proposed. The commission may, be, uh, may recall that the African burial ground site, which would repurpose the East 126th Street bus depot, is located one block to the east of the proposed acquisition site. Um, and the community board has some concerns about that. And also, um, the parking area is not enclosed. It's open to the sky. Um, community Board 11 East Harlem has historically had uh, significant issues with asthma, particularly childhood asthma. And the community board felt that the garage should be covered, should be a covered space that, that's mechanically ventilated. And lastly, um, a lack of design sensitivity and unwillingness to commit the financial resources to build a really uh, aesthetically pleasing a state-of-the-art garage. Uh, using as an example garages that are built in other parts of the borough where a considerable amount of resources uh, and aesthetic uh, treatment was placed on those facilities. Uh, Community Board 11 felt that this particular location should receive the same type of treatment as well. Additionally, we have received, um, as Jim had said in his opening remarks, we've received uh, emails over the weekend. We continue to receive e emails uh, underscoring concern about the placement of the garage, of the parking facility at this location. And also, uh, we received some correspondence which we placed in your package on Friday from the East Harlem Coalition, Community Coalition, which also underscored uh, and emphasized uh, many of the concerns which I expressed to you this afternoon. Um, that concludes my presentation. I'll take your questions or comments. Questions, comments from the commission? Yes, Commissioner Reedy. In some of the correspondence, there's been reference to alternative sites. Um, do we know anything about that, or will... Department of Sanitation be prepared to discuss those? So the Department of Sanitation is here, and they will be prepared to talk about that. But in, in some, um, this type of action requires a fair share review, and the applicant has to look at alternate sites and basically analyze how they do not meet their need, their service needs. So the short answer is yes. Thank you. Other questions or comments? Then, oh, yes, Commissioner Levin. Another thing I'd be interested in hearing about from sanitation is the adequacy of this location. Is it, is it big enough, and is a 20-year lease uh, long enough term? There's information in our materials, I think it's in the fair share analysis, that says that sanitation typically looks for a lot area of 60 to 100,000 100, um, square feet in siting these kinds of garages, and this one's considerably smaller than that. So I hope they can uh, shed some more light on how they determined that this site was big enough. Okay. They're here, and they're here. Okay. Yes, Commissioner Reedy. Yeah, just one other question. Regarding the uh, existing Potamkin um, operation, what happens to that going forward? You had mentioned that some of that 
um, site, the remaining site, will be used for some parking as well. Does the auto dealership remain in business? Or? Oh, yeah, just to clarify, the auto dealership will remain in business. They'll still occupy the eastern building. Mm -hmm. It anchors the eastern portion of the block, so they're not going anywhere, at least not in the near term. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Other, Commissioner Gallows. Um, I just have questions um, that would be helpful to hear on Wednesday about was it considered, uh, the Department of Sanitation consider enclosing the garage as part of this process? And if so, why was it, you know, why did they choose not to? Um, and then it would just be helpful to know um, what will happen, what's the plan for the two existing sites? One you said is owned by the Health and Hospitals Corporation, and the other will remain, I think you said, with the Department of Sanitation. Just be helpful to know if there's any thought about what may happen in the future with those sites. Yes, Commissioner Marin. Um, actually, Michelle actually prompted another question for me because we're experiencing a bad odor in the Bronx. Do these trucks get washed down before they get parked? Uh, or, or do they just get parked? And I mean, what's the frequency of wash down? Because we, we, we're having trucks that pick up garbage, smelly garbage, especially in the summer, that are being parked in an open air facility. So my concern is, 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 is of smells for the community um, because they can't be proliferating and really detrimental. Well, I can tell you that in terms of the frequency of washing, uh, sanitation can speak to that. Um, but in terms of an area where the trucks can be washed, there is a wash bay located right here, which, mm. is, which is within the enclosed building. So there is space for the trucks to be washed down. Uh, in terms of how often they're washed down uh, and when they're washed down, sanitation can speak to that. Yes, because I got to tell you, I can't even use my garden on the weekends. That, that's how bad the smell from sanitation mm. comes from the, from the Hunts Point area. So um, I ask these specific questions because now you know the open air facility actually brought up that, that thought. So if we can get some more information on that, I would appreciate it. Other commissioners? Mm -hmm. Okay, well, this item will be for public hearing on Wednesday. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we're going to go back to item number 13. This is the 34th Street heliport on page 355 of your package. The special permit to allow the continued use of uh, the heliport for a term of 10 years. Uh, Bob Tuttle, the Manhattan office, will uh, present the results of the community board and borough president's uh, recommendations. Thank you. Good afternoon, uh, Chairperson Lago, Commissioners. This is a joint application by NYC Department of Small Business Services and NYC Economic Development Corporation for a special permit to facilitate the continued heliport uses, use at the 34th Street heliport in the medical corridor in Manhattan Community District 6. This application is returning for a public hearing following certification on February 21st and review by Manhattan Community Board 6 and the Manhattan Borough President. The project is located uh, west of the U.S. Pier headline on the East River, e east of the northbound service road of the FDR Drive, and south of East 34th Street. Access to the site is primarily from East 34th Street and the FDR Service Drive. The site is within an M23 manufacturing zoning district. Land use in the area is characterized by a mix of public facilities and institutions, um, including NYU Langone Medical Center and the Bellevue Hospital Campus and high-density mixed-use residential and commercial buildings. The total lot area, exclusive of underwater leasehold property, contains approximately 40,000 square feet, of which 26,442 square feet is used for helicopter operations. The special permit is pursuant to Section 7466 and would allow heliport use for a term of 10 years. The special permit is subject to the following findings. That the heliport is an appropriate use of the land and would not unduly interfere with surrounding land uses and that due consideration has been given to selection of a site situated near or adjacent to large parks or other open areas or bodies of water in this case. The heliport is a city-owned facility. EDC's contract with the current operator expires in August, on August 31st of this year with a six-month extension through February 2018. Prior to the conclusion of the extension period, EDC plans to issue a competitive RFP for an operator to manage the heliport until the end of the term for the special permit. The site comprises five parking spaces, two construction tra type trailers, which are the north and south passenger terminals, an underground fuel tank, and five helicopter landing pads. The heliport serves the business community, police operations, medical evacuations, and the print and electronic news media. The terms of operation are, there shall be no weekend operations, flight operations are limited to a maximum of 28,800 flights a year, there are no tour 
operations. The operator of the heliport shall provide good maintenance to the terminal buildings and the environment under the control of the city. Noise and other environmental impacts will continue to be observed. Any other use that may be considered must address public safety considerations. And operations are limited, with the exception for emergency, medical, public safety, fire, police, and print and electronic news media, to 8 a.m. to 8 p.m., Monday through Friday. Now, the Federal Aviation Administration provided city planning with a letter of no objection to continued operations of the heliport for the requested 10-year period, and that's part of your briefing package. Also part of your briefing package is the community board's recommendation. Uh, the community board met on April 12, 2017, and voted to issue an approval with conditions by a vote of 32 in favor and 11 opposed. The recommendation supported the 10-year extension of the heliport operations pursuant to the terms under which the heliport now operates and the terms in which I just spoke. Um, and the, con the conditions of approval were, one, that a five-year performance review be conducted regarding the operation, terms, and conditions of the agreement, and that this report be provided to the community board for its review and oversight as to compliance and uh, community impact. And two, that the heliport operator shall be required to maintain adequate lighting, visibility, and safe access for pedestrians, vehicles, and bicycles. Uh, EDC will concur, will concur with the request for a five-year performance review and is working to set up a internal notification system that will flag when the report needs to be submitted to the community board. EDC will also work with the operator to ensure that the area is safe and properly maintained, and to that end is working, or has worked out a plan that will, should begin construction in June, and that will provide new fencing, lighting, and security cameras around the heliport. This plan was presented to the community board, and their comments from the board were incorporated into that final plan. The Manhattan Borough President's recommendation is due today, and as soon as we receive that, we'll pass it along to you. Um, to follow up on some of the commissioner's questions from the uh, certification, uh, there was a question posed about how EDC is able to monitor heliport operations. The EDC receives all of the 311 complaints, so is able to address those as they arise and can incorporate them into the five-year report. The operator can only charge for flights that are listed in the logbook, which is also used to compile the number of flights, and so this gives the operator an economic incentive to make sure the log is correct. There was a question about how the East River Esplanade interacts with the heliport. Uh, the bike path is DOT's responsibility to construct. It appears that they do have a, a proposed path that, um, that they plan to uh, pass through some of the portion that would be allotted to the heliport. <coughs> Uh, the heliport has no opposition to construction of the bike path here. Uh, in the future, use of that portion of property would be included in, in an operating agreement uh, if DOT does decide to move forward with the bike path as they have planned. Um, and DOT has presented that plan also to the community board. And a question was asked regarding the heliport's benefit to area businesses. Uh, key, user, key users of the heliport include corporate and charter traffic. The heliport also serves a very important function for med medevac flights bound for the adjacent hospital complexes. Having a heliport in the East Midtown vicinity and having the three in the area is widely considered to be very important to business operations in um, Midtown and Downtown uh, and because of the much faster transit times. And with that, I'm happy to open this up to any questions. I first have to observe how pleased I am to see this situation rectified when I was at EDC. It was during that period of time where the heliport was operating with no <laughs> extant license or special permit. So very good to see order coming out of what was a little bit more chaotic. Um, any questions from commissioners? And this will go to a public hearing on Wednesday. Thank you, Bob. Thank you. Thank you. We have a um, couple of council modifications that I propose that we need to discuss. Uh, one is the, uh, first one is the Westchester Muse rezoning in the Bronx, which was uh, approved by the City Planning Commission. The council is uh, proposing a modification. Um, Sean, are you going to walk us through the modification? Or, uh, Manny Lagares is going to walk us through the modification. Uh, good afternoon, Commissioner. Okay, this is the Westchester Muse project, which was approved by the City Planning Commission. Uh, December 12 of 2016, a uh, public hearing was held on March the 8th, and the City Planning Commission approved uh, the application on uh, April 5th. Now, the City Council modification basically uh, limits the applicability of the tax amendment uh, to the project area. The project area, uh, approximately three-fourths of the block, which consists of uh, 16 lots, and uh, 
the original application on the text amendment uh, was to designate the rezoning area as an MIH area and apply the maximum residential lot coverage of 65% to MIH developments in our six districts. Also to apply the maximum FAR 3.6 to MIH developments uh, regardless of their proximity to white streets. So again, the council, in, instead of uh, having uh, other R6 districts within MIH, uh, it's just limited it to area, it's called uh, area one, the map that was approved uh, for this project. It, it should be in your package, uh, let me just refer to it here. That'll be area one uh, and the date of adoption, which is written there. Uh, and they're also just selecting option number one. Are there any questions on that? Questions from commissioners? If not, then I would ask for an assent from the commission by show of hands to sending a letter to this um, city council that their proposed modification is within scope. Thank you, Edwin. Now on to the next one. Thank you. The uh, next one's at the... 1860 Eastern Parkway, um, the scope determination letter and city council modification letter are both in your package. And uh, Anthony Grande will uh, discuss what the modification is. Uh, so just as a reminder, this was a rezoning application from an R6 and R, uh, R6 C23 district to an R8A uh, with the C24 um, overlay. Um, this was at the corner of Atlantic Avenue and Eastern Parkway. Uh, the CPC approved the application um, on April 5th, and uh, the MIH area that was mapped was including option one and option two. Um, the council modification is uh, removing option two um, and only leaving option one um, for this MIH area. I'll take any questions. questions, comments from commissioners? Okay, the same as sent by a show of hands to send a letter back to the council saying it's within scope. Thank you. Thank you. Um, moving on to future votes and post hearing follow up on May 24th, uh, we have uh, sent you a number of um, proposed um, uh, reports for approval. The first one is 7404 Northern Boulevard rezoning. We received a letter today from the uh, applicant, which I think has just been distributed to you, um, responding to the community board's um, comments regarding uh, loading uh, at the facility, which we will incorporate into the report. We haven't received it, so if we could get it distributed. We, we just got it moments ago. Uh, <laughs> Linda, did you get the letter to you? Hannah. Um, at, and and we'll, we'll, we'll get you that, that, that letter. Okay. We'll get Hannah to get the letter. Okay. Um, 240, uh, 242 West 53rd Street, we've prepared a favorable report. It's a special permit to allow a parking garage for 184 parking spaces. Section 93-122 text amendment, the zoning text amendment uh, in the Hudson Yards District to facilitate a storage area for landscaping equipment. The boulevard at Highland Plaza are uh, two authorizations to allow a group parking facility and parking reduction for which we have an environmental impact statement. Uh, and then we have uh, three applications regarding um, uh, subdivision of uh, zoning lots uh, at 286 uh, Bradford Avenue is to subdivide two lots into three, uh, 337 and 341 South Richmond Street uh, to subdivide one lot into two, and 802 820 Van Duza Street to subdivide one lot into three. If I might clarify, the third item, the section 93-122 text amendment is for Hudson Yards, but it is actually a, um, it, it is the certification of sites of a minimum of 55,000 square feet. It is not the item that you had mentioned. That is a separate one. Thank you for the correction. Um, Moving on to June 7th, uh, we will be proposing favorable uh, reports for uh, Whitlock and 165th Street rezoning, which a, a uh, development for two mixed-use buildings with a total of uh, approximately 474 units of affordable housing in the Bronx. Uh, 
Uh, LM Plaza Text Amendment, a zoning text amendment regarding the location of Bonneville Plaza in the Special Old Manhattan District. Uh, we had a letter from the applicant, which was in your package this weekend. And uh, Greater East Midtown Rezoning. We have Bob Tuttle and Ezra Mosey here to um, take you through part two of our follow-up. Good afternoon. We are just pulling up. Sorry, forgive us one second. Why don't you start while this is called up? Because we have your presentation. Sure. All right. Um, good afternoon. Um, I'm Ezra Moser. I'm the planner for Community District 5. Um, I'll be joined shortly by my colleague, Bob Tuttle, who's a planner for Community District 6. And we are co managing the East Midtown, uh, the, sorry, the proposal for Greater East Midtown. Um, we're here for our second post hearing follow up. And um, as Hopefully you should see in the uh, printouts of the presentation. We are going to be covering 12 topics today, some of which uh, will be familiar from our previous post hearing follow-up on the 8th. Um, so the uh, first item is we'd like to provide an update on our um, above grade improvements. Um, these are, uh, there are several improvements that um, we committed to in a letter to the borough president. And um, uh, two weeks ago, DOT led a walking and working tour along East 53rd Street with Council Member Dan Gorodnik and borough president uh, Gail Brewer, as well as representatives from the three affected uh, business improvement districts, uh, area property owners, and city staff. DOT is currently in the process of incorporating comments from that tour into a street treatment Proposal. DOT is also coordinating with the Grand Central Partnership bid. Uh, great. Sorry, hold on one second. Let's sync up. These are the 12 topics. I uh, hope they're in the same order as uh, the presentation provided. Again, we we're starting with a progress update on the above grade improvements. Um, DOT is coordinating with the Grand Central Partnership bid regarding a refresh of Pershing Square East and a designation of the space as an official pedestrian plaza. The city is continuing its work with area stakeholders to find an appropriate location for a shared street pilot project and to determine an implementation strategy. DOT is also undergoing necessary internal coordination uh, to implement new vehicular patterns along Park Avenue. Um, these could be best characterized as traffic calming measures. Um, any questions before we proceed to the next item? Yes, Commissioner. Yeah. What were what was the traffic implementation called? And and um, is this like shared streets that there will be some sort of a pilot or? This is a um, a uh, temporary uh, inter. Yeah, it's the what's the, what's the phrase I'm looking for. Yeah, well, they're in the left-hand turn bays. So these are spaces that are currently DOT identified as uh, underutilized um, in current traffic patterns. So right, right, right now, this is a traffic calming measure that they're implementing in to turn. see how it will, if it'll actually um, clean up some of the traffic issues that they have because people will know their designated lanes instead of swerving in and out. If that ends up um, as they believe that it will calming traffic, then they would do they would start to. Um, work with the governing group to try to implement the capital build out, which would then in involve the kind of the <laughs> rendering that you see here, which would be space um, for seating, plantings, and whatnot. This is the this one is um, one of the plans that's really multi phase, and would be in, even in conjunction with um, some other work that would be done with other city and state partners. 
But the first part that we've committed to is the traffic calming measure, just to see how that worked first. Because there were some there were some comments from the public they wanted to make sure that the that before we did any kind of capital improvement, that we were not going to see um, snarl traffic. Mm -hmm. So these are interim treatments to um, parts of the lanes that that are right before a left-hand turn bay that uh, traffic that is passing through would not utilize. They found that these tended to, to use the word again, to be underutilized uh, parts of the lane. So this is uh, the first stage for an interim treatment, the mm -hmm. first location. Any other questions? Yes, Commissioner Levin. So how would these be reflected in our action on the Proposed rezoning. These don't. These are separate from the public public realm improvements, correct? Well, these would be the first phase, essentially, of our of our concept plan. And there was a desire, uh, you know, testimony or the public review to try to uh, roll out anything um, right. that you know was possible to be done uh, concurrent with council approval. So that's what okay. So, the, but the, so then these would come. Would these be? Reported on similarly to the concept plan for the public realm improvements, so the, or, or or committed to by the city, these will happen anyway, and then the governing group will work on the public realm improvements. This is part of the concept plan. So, but the concept plan, as far as the funding stream, can only be used for capital improvements. So any of the interim projects is out of DOT's operating budget. Um, but how DOT is looking at it is a build up of two actual request for the capital uh, funding. So as the governing group is working and when they've already done the, when DOT has already done an interim project, the governing group, if they feel that it's successful, would then reach out to DOT to actually design the full plans that they could then fund. Okay, but our action will reflect these commitments by the city. So the action to uh, uh, if a it were, uh, approve the whole approval thing. of this, um, the, you're approving the concept plan in its, but it's, a basically a living plan so the governing group does have the ability to modify that plan but the plan that we're discussing here is analyzed in the EIS and so that EIS document is intended to be an instrument for the decision makers which would be the governing group in the future to look at when they're implementing a plan what are the trade-offs um, how does it in impact pedestrian traffic vehicular traffic and all of those but there is no um, in this approval, you're really approving the, a concept plan that it will always be maintained by the governing group. That's what the text really um, right. uh, mandates that the governing group do. But Bob, if I might, I think Commissioner Levin's question may be, what comfort do we have that these items, which that, are not capital items, that was it. Yeah. will be done? And I believe they're covered in the deputy mayor's letter in which she laid out interim steps that we're taking. Okay. And uh, these and, four are all, yeah. yes, in the deputy. Right. And that will be uh, referred to in our report, acknowledged in our report as a thing. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Good. And it's included as part of the road present recommendation. Right. Um, any further questions? I have the same question. <laughs> so um, the borough president requested that a citywide civic organization that includes, um, whose mission includes urban design or uh, public space advocacy to be added to the governing group. Uh, DCP staff uh, recommends modifying proposed text to include such an organization in the governing group. Staff also recommends that um, <clears throat> adding an additional mayoral appointee to the governing group to retain mayoral control. Uh, sorry, it recommends the addition of this, uh, of an additional mayoral appointee. It's necessary uh, since it is through zoning that funds for the public realm improvements are generated and mayoral control will ensure that the funds are used appropriately on city property. Any questions? Yes, Commissioner Levin. Do we have an idea who the civic organization might be? Has that been discussed yet? To give a sense, what we're doing is last time we covered some topics, and on any of those on which there were remaining open questions, we're bringing them back in the hopes of 
um, seeing how many of the issues we can address now, and then we will turn to additional topics that we did not discuss um, at our last review session. So that's why these are sort of quick little update reports from what we discussed at the last review session. Thanks, Ezra. Thank you. Can I, may I ask a question? Of course. Uh, on the citywide civic, so mm -hmm. um, what will the, considering there are a couple that could be chosen, uh, what, what will the process be to determine who that might be? Currently, we're allowing the governing group to um, write their own procedures. Um, I mean, they will still be compliant with New York State uh, public meetings law and um, mm -hmm. everything, you know, to ensure appropriate transparency. But as of now, the, the governing group structure is so that they have um, majority some discretion. Okay. So, so, so the governing group would add the civic? I mean, the text would. The text would say a civic group. Civic group, okay. exactly. And Should be some lively discussions. <laughs> Um, so the CPC heard testimony um, <clears throat> about clarifying whether sites with existing transit easements uh, may count that built-out easement as a cleared wide street frontage for the purposes of meeting uh, the qualifying site criteria of proposed section 81.613. DCP believes that this is an appropriate clarification and is pretty limited in scope. Um, our policy essentially is that if you've already made a commitment to uh, provide for transit on site, that shouldn't preclude you from taking part in the uh, new density and FAR framework. Any questions? Okay, that one seems straightforward. <laughs> right. Uh, now revisiting Green Acre Park shadows. Um, to reiterate, no significant shadow impacts were identified uh, in fact, in the park, in the EIS. However, as we discussed at the previous uh, post-hearing follow-up, the department did conduct site-specific analysis that illustrated that the incremental shadow would largely fall on a trellis and trees. City Hall and DCP met with Greenacre Park to discuss these site-specific findings. DCP further modeled a development scenario on the potential site nearest to Greenacre Park that was identified as casting shadows um, on the park in the draft EIS. It was determined through this uh, additional analysis that development, that the, that the type of development that could take place under the proposed East Midtown rezoning would create no more shadow on the park than a building that could be built as of right under the current um, zoning regulations affecting the area. So the current as of right zoning framework. Any questions? I would just note on this that I participated in this meeting. It was uh, lasted for over an hour with quite a number of representatives um, of Green Acre Park, including the granddaughter of the founder. Um, and so it was quite useful to hear their, their, their passion for what is a, a special park. Um, they were particularly concerned about one of the um, development sites. And I think the uh, aha moment was a recognition that the as of right development today would cast the same shadows. There was also a recognition that um, much of the concern stems from as of right development along Second Avenue that is not part of the action that, that we're considering. The morning light, presumably. <laughs> exactly, the, the morning northern light, which this park currently receives. The commission also heard testimony uh, regarding the vesting of hotels, which would be subject to a new special permit um, pursuant to proposed section <coughs> 81621 of the proposed action. Section 1133, and more specifically 11332 of the current zoning text, um, provides vesting uh, provisions that include a BSA process for developments that have commenced construction but have not yet completed their foundation. Uh, DCP believes that the current provisions and BSA process are appropriate, and we reviewed a New York and company quarterly report covering new hotels being opened between 2015 and 2019, as well as uh, testimony presented to and submitted to the CPC, and found that there are um, two hotels with NB permits in the subdistrict, um, both of which there was testimony covering. And one of these, uh, located at 12 East 48th Street, will have its foundation substantially complete by the time of council approval. 
And overall, we believe the BSA process is sufficient to address these concerns. Any questions? Yes, Commissioner Eady. So if I understand you correctly, mm -hmm. you're indicating that there are two sites for which this, this issue, this is an issue for. One of whom will have its foundation completed by the time. Mm -hmm. And the other one you're saying would have to then stop construction and go through a BSA approval process to continue? We, that, that depends on how far along it is. There's actually just limited information mm -hmm. on that one at the time where um, we can look into it further. But yeah, it, yeah. It, se it seems a little onerous to you know, have someone go through a process like that while in construction. I think one thing, two points on that. One is one of the projects is really in a stage of investment, and we're not actually sure that that is moving forward. Um, we also have not kept any secret that we were planning to have a, special, a hotel special permit, and so we do think of the, the amount of outreach that we've done prior to certification um, as a, a real, um, you know, basically telegraphing what would be coming and allowing people to prepare for that. Um, so for those that, for then the one that exists that we feel will probably finish their foundation, but may not, um, we do have a mechanism that we feel is appropriate um, and it's already written into the zoning. And the ability to just, uh, for lack of a better word, grandfather them at this time, you think would be inappropriate? We do. Yeah, I'd be glad to weigh in here. The first we had heard of the hotels was at the public hearing. Um, the issue of requiring a special permit for a hotel as part of the East Midtown zoning has long, long been telegraphed. And so our sense was that it was appropriate to use that mechanism, which had long been telegraphed, particularly since the second of these hotels appears to be at an investment discussion phase. So they haven't begun construction? Yeah, that's... Oh, I'm sorry. I think okay. I did on the second one. Got it. Okay. I thought they had. Okay. Thanks. And it is at an initial enough stage that it was not actually in the uh, New York and Company report. Okay. Thanks. Any further questions? Right. So the commission also heard testimony uh, advocating the ability for buildings uh, to cantilever parts of their floor plate over required sidewalk widenings. Uh, DCP understands the issues of commercial office buildings requiring such larger floor plates um, in order to be economically viable. However, sidewalk widenings as a term that's described in section 3753F, they need to be open to the sky. These regulations apply throughout Midtown and to make the request of change, we would have to do a full study of the uh, implications. Uh, so we will not be recommending that changes be made to proposed text to accommodate cantilevers over sidewalk widenings. Question. You're on a roll, Ezra. Yeah. <laughs> um, mandatory talks. So, um, based on comments from the commission, we looked specifically at projected site 16, which is commonly referred to as the, the Pfizer block or Pfizer site, um, to determine if there's applicability for a mandatory POPs requirement on larger sites such as this one. Uh, staff continues to advise that an involuntary and non bonus scheme would be a departure from our current practice of aligning public and private interests with a voluntary FAR bonus mechanism, regardless of a development site's size. Staff continues to support the public concourse special permit that would be created as part of this proposal. Um, <clears throat> and the special permit would provide an FAR bonus and allow public review of uh, these spaces. Two things that we believe will help ensure that any future POPs truly provide um, a superlative public um, now I'm going to hand it over to my colleague, Bob Tuttle, unless there are any questions. Um, this First, is any questions on the mandatory POPs? Okay. Okay. Thank you, Ezra. So we did want to follow up briefly on uh, the topic of residential conversions pursuant to Article 1, Chapter 5 of the Zoning Resolution due to questions from the uh, commissioners at the uh, previous review session. So again, we're not seeing any issues at this point, but it's something that we have committed to continue monitoring. Uh, we've committed to a five-year review that we would send to the borough president, um, but we will consistently be monitoring the situation. And in, we also expect that the borough president will continue to monitor the situation. And if they have um, concerns, 
we do have a very good working relationship, and it's something that I think that we um, would be happy to work with them on if it becomes an issue. Yes, Commissioner Arfon. Um, five years is a really long time in the life of a neighborhood. Um, I, I'm just wondering why you came up with that rather than a three-year review. If you're seeing a trend, wouldn't it be better to get something? I mean, just from my limited experience on this commission, I know there are others who've sat here for much longer. Um, things like Soho, where there was a conversion to um, residential happened without a countervailing mechanism in place to change it. Um, similarly, um, you know, there have been others. I'm sure the other commissioners can tell me. I'm this late hour. I'm sort of brain dead. But um, uh, downtown Brooklyn and Long Island City are two where I think um, the goals of um, the staff were really, and the commission were really um, thwarted by a very quick changeover to residential. And if this really is to be the preeminent um, office place for the future, in conjunction with the far west side, it just seems to me you need a tighter mechanism for recognizing when there's a trend. Okay, uh, we can certainly look at that. <clears throat> and, and if I could just yes, talk. Commissioner Delos. Um, and I'm assuming if we're going to share with the borough president, that would be shared with the commission <coughs> as well. Would that just be part of the practice normally? Yes. Um, so also, the commissioners heard testimony advocating the ability for building, oh, sorry. Um, we won't go backwards. <laughs> um, so this, um, It'll this make us younger, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Let's start over. Okay, so this proposal was intended to create class A office space, and our analysis found that there were sufficient sites to meet these goals. What the commission heard was a desire for residential uh, lots to be incorporated into these development sites. Uh, we did not see in our initial analysis uh, that there would be a deterrent from the existing residential or new sites. And so when we did our analysis, what we found was in grouping and merging sites that we found more, I mean, we found 30 sites um, and we only actually have development rights for the 16 that are projected. Um, so we don't see an issue with not including residential. And as we've always um, you know, made very clear, this is really about commercial floor area. Uh, and we don't see the need to include residential um, lots in those development sites or to allow more than the 20% cap on residential. We want this to be very commercial. Um, so uh, we are not proposing any change to our, um, to our proposal. And in fact, um, a change would be out of scope and would um, set us back truly at zero. Questions? Um, now on to the improvement fund. So the commission heard testimony from Council Member Grodnick uh, that protections must be put in place to ensure that the public realm improvement funds are maintained in a lockbox specifically reserved for the improvement of the East Midtown public realm. The interagency working group uh, coordinated with OMB and EDC to determine the best approach for sequestering contributions from the fund. Uh, and it's been determined that an account maintained by EDC is our best option in ensuring that the funds will be independent of the city's general fund. This will require no changes to how the current text is written. This is just to give comfort that the funds are not going to be commingled, that they will be av available for the public realm improvements. Commissioner Levin. Yeah, I, I don't have the text in front of me, but I remember flagging this as I was reading the text. The text says nothing at all about who holds the funds. Shouldn't there be some clarification in the text to, to acknowledge that it is um, to be a sequestered fund, that it'll not be commingled? I mean, we've done this in other cases where we're creating a fund, and it's just really important that the zoning text, I think, indicate where someone could go to find this money if they were interested, because this kind of money has a way of disappearing as succeeding planners and governing board members come and go, uh, we'll just forget where it is. So I don't have any issue with the proposed accounting by EDC, but I think the zoning text should make it clear that that's where it is. We'll look at the best way to memorialize it okay. because the, the nightmare scenario that you paint is one we all would want right. to avoid. Right. Can we, <coughs> excuse me, can the district 
Yeah. No, because that's a separate not-for-profit. It's a separate organization, which is not what we're. That's. Them, but I mean, in terms of sequestering the money. What we did on this, uh, Commissioner Cantor, is that we worked with the city's lawyers of figuring out what would be the most effective way of handling these funds so that they would remain within city control, but they would not be merged into the city's general fund so that they could always be identified separately. And um, I see Anita coming up to uh, <laughs> educate us. We certainly can say that the funds will be sequestered, but more detail than that would be probably a mistake because things change over time. So we will we will commit to that and leave it at that. Okay. Great, thank you. Okay. Um, so regarding the minimum contribution amount, so we have reviewed all of the relevant information. Yeah, yes. Yes, but Commissioner maybe, Delos. Um, and, and, and maybe this this involves you as well, Anita. So when when it's sequestered, does that change how it's um, the information about it is publicly available? No. The information regarding the funds will be publicly available through the mechanism that we established with respect to the governing group. Okay. So that will be clear, and we're now only talking about how the funds are held, but no, it will not change that at all. Thank you. Sequestered in the sense that they don't get merged into yeah. the general fund, not sure sequestered in the follow. sense of hidden. <laughs> <laughs> sequestered but not hidden. Sequestered and transparent. Okay. Yes, there we go. <laughs> that, that is not an oxymoron. <laughs> Maybe we should just say that. <laughs> we'll use that in our conversations <laughs> with the council member. Um, so we've reviewed all the information relevant to the contribution amount um, from outside sources and then also the comments that we received here from you all. Uh, we believe that the amount is properly set based on the information that we have, <clears throat> that we have an appropriate option is available to developers that allows them to initiate a market study at any time to modify the amount and that we have appropriate mechanisms um, in place to modify the minimum contribution amount and methodology if that becomes necessary and we see that there actually is no development occurring because um, this is the doomsday scenario that some have said that it is. Um, but we just haven't seen evidence of that at this point and so we're still confident in um, our original um, minimum contribution amount. Any comments? Back to you, Bob. Thank you. And finally, so you also heard testimony about augmenting the provisions for um, split lots by the boundaries of the subdistrict. And so the request, in our initial um, certified text, we had a provision that allowed, um, and, and it's written here, um, that it allowed any development that was 50% within the East Midtown subdistrict, that whole zoning lot would be able to utilize the subdistrict regulations. Uh, upon public comment, we removed that from the A text. Um, so that we didn't encroach on the Fifth Avenue subdistrict um, or on the residential lots in between Second and Third Avenue. Uh, then, now in, in public comment, we heard that there were some unintended um, consequences for lots that don't cause any issues with those two areas, but are also within the special Midtown district, which is an area that obviously we're very comfortable with density. So what we would recommend is that we put that language back in but that we just don't allow any of those uh, zoning lots that are um, within the Fifth Avenue subdistrict or that residential district to be included. And so basically, if 50% of your uh, zoning lot is within the East Midtown subdistrict and the other portion is within the <coughs> Midtown district, the special Midtown district, but not the Fifth Avenue subdistrict, you can mm -hmm. use this provision. So this affects Almost no locks. Um, <laughs> so you can see, I think the, the good example maybe is right here. Mm -hmm. So this part, this purple is all within the Midtown District, but the, the gray here is showing the East Midtown Subdistrict. So this corner and this corner, if 50% of the lot was within the Midtown District, um, they could utilize those. And so we think that that is reasonable um, and does protect the areas um, in uh, the Turtle Bay neighborhood, and then also Fifth Avenue, which we, which is really, you know, it's its own unique district. We think it, it puts in the proper protection, protections. And uh, sorry to end with such a 
wonky topic, but I do think it shows, one, the degree of analysis and the fact, the benefit that we get from our public hearings of finding out about rather unique unintended consequences that we're able to address. Any comments? Any other questions um, about, yes, Commissioner Efron. I'm not sure it's one you can answer, but it's just one I've been thinking about and want to get out there, which is um, whether there are adequate resources for the bid. I think it's only one, but maybe there's a Fifth Avenue bid that covers some portion of it. To do some of the things that there's sort of an underlying assumption they'll be doing to make sure that this is successful, whether it's the um, shared streets or the public squares or um, those things, and how do we make it clear that it's important to have adequate resources towards the maintenance of those public spaces in order for this to be successful. So there, um, there are three bids. So Fifth Avenue is one of them, Grand Central, and then um, East Midtown Partnership. Um, and so we've worked, the uh, Fifth Avenue bid has a very small portion. And then actually, they went on the walking tour of 53rd Street because they have the terminus. Um, so they'd be involved in that. But other than that, it's the other two bids. They were on the steering committee. Um, we've been in a lot of conversations with them um, as we've rolled out the concept plan. Their concern has not thus far been about maintenance. Um, their concern has been about the placement of the shared streets and making sure that we were very engaged with property owners, um, that we understood where curb cuts are, what was happening with loading. Um, but their concerns haven't really been about the financial side. Now, in DOT's work, when they, when they governing group um, would be doing the capital improvement, DOT in their outreach process would have already lined up the maintenance partner. So actually nothing moves forward without a maintenance partner. Um, so the, the, once the capital improvement was done, then the maintenance partner would take over. So that is part of the long-term process, but I will say that funding, at least, has never been mentioned to us as one of their concerns. It's more about the um, uh, less, the maintenance is obviously important, but really more mm -hmm. about the um, enlivening public spaces and security and other things. But so I'm not sure if there's room for it in our report, but it seems important to make it clear that there's a, a need for that. Mm -hmm. I think that we can stress the important role of the bids as evidenced by the fact that they were on the steering mm -hmm. committee and have been partners throughout it. Um, they're not an afterthought in this mm -hmm. process. Right, yeah, they've been engaged. Um, I mean, they're still very engaged. They've been a, a great partner to have. Other comments? Well, we are getting you out of here on the stroke of five. <laughs> Thank you very much. We're not Incredibly quite oh. Oh. Doing, Sorry. Oh. <laughs> I, I hate to throw cold water. We'll be here till <laughs> six at least. <laughs> We just want to do the uh, future votes for June 21st. Um, there's only two, uh, Bay Chester and the Bronx um, will be coming back, and um, that's the uh, shopping center up uh, up in the Bronx next to uh, um, the Bay Plaza in Co-op City. Mm -hmm. And um, ECF on East 96th Street, Calvin Brown, is here to discuss any issues that uh, are uh, to follow up on any questions that may remain on the uh, public hearing. Well, we are following up with the applicants to make sure that they provide us with um, a comprehensive response to some of the concerns and questions that were raised at the public hearing. So we look forward to sharing that with the commissioners after June 5th um, as a public hearing post follow up. If I could know that I have met with the head of the ECF and we had a discussion about what additional information would be helpful to have, um, we thought that rather than presenting sort of um, information in a more scattershot that it would make sense at our next review session comprehensively to go through. I wasn't able to meet with her until late last week. And again, we just thought it better. Let's do one very professional job of it um, at our next review session in two Great. weeks. I apologize. That's why I was getting so ahead of myself. <laughs> yes, Commissioner does, Levin. Does that include also um, addressing the issue that Carolyn Harris raised about the park status of the playground? Yes. That yes. In the we yes. actually Good. have already, that was one of the first pieces of analysis okay. that yes. we have done. Excellent. Thank you. And I'll also note that if there were questions following that, we could have another review session. So there will be at least two opportunities. Thank you. Other comments? 
I'm so happy to say we are done. <laughs> We're two minutes after 5 o'clock. <laughs>